Hey, what's up, man? Good. How are you? Good, good. Nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> yes, yes. Nice to meet you as well. Let me uh, swap my view here. Sure thing. Nice. All right, man. You, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Totten, how's that feel? Is it weird? Uh, a little bit. Kind of surreal. Um, never thought you would get to this point because it takes literally forever. Um, but it's, it, at first it's really all not that different, except you get to force your students to call you doctor now. <laughs> nice. Well, if you don't mind me asking, it's always, uh, it's always weird, but it's a question I always wonder, how old are you? I'm 35 turning 36 in December. All, all right. Awesome. Yeah. I'm 33. So, <clears throat> and, um, man, it's, uh, it's always great to get to talk with other historians. Every time I talk with like Marie or, anybody with a PhD I always feel like the stupid guy in the room but it's one of the reasons I like talking to y'all <laughs> well um anyone can be a historian as long as you love history and you practices practice the tools of history yeah yeah then, then there's the other class of people I run into the history buffs <laughs> yes for uh and for my topic the civil war there are many buffs who oh know, my gosh who do not know as much as they think <laughs> Yeah. Are you familiar with Dr. Kelly Jones? I have met her uh, a couple of times, yes. She's coming on to talk about her book, um, Over Slavery in Arkansas, on Thursday. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, man, how... Um, I saw that you, I guess, had gone to one of your graduate programs in Florida. Where are you from originally? I was born in Portland, Maine, so the frigid north, um, and my family is all from New Hampshire and New York and Connecticut <clears throat> and, and Maine, and uh, my dad watched way too much Miami Vice in the 1980s and decided he wanted to move to Miami, uh, and so he did, and I grew up in South Florida. I went to J.P. Terravella High School, and our rival was Stoneman Douglas, which if you've been watching your news, you know that was shot up by that insane person a few years ago. They were our rivals. My mom works right across the street from them. And my former uh, vice principal is the principal of that uh, uh, high school now. I got my uh, MA and my BA, and my bachelor's and my master's from the University of Central Florida, which is the 2017 national champions. I don't care what Alabama says. Um, and uh, I was actually working in curriculum development and grant writing at the Institute for Simulation and Training, which specialized in distance learning for um, the Marine Corps, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the FBI at Glencoe, Georgia, the Orange County Fire Rescue Department, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, the, um, uh, there was a lot of political issues about getting grants. And so I was like, oh, I'll go back to academia. Um, and I'm glad I did because it enabled me to meet Marie in the program up at UC, um, University of Arkansas. And I had a great advisor there, Dr. Sutherland, uh, Daniel Sutherland, who just retired. He's moving over to England now. And he, uh, he went from being a Civil War historian to an expert on James Whistler, James McNeil Whistler, the artist. It's a, it's a pretty big pond to jump, but he managed to do so. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of how I got here. It was, uh, if you had told me 10 years ago, be like, hey, man, you're living in Orlando right now. How about you move to Russellville, Arkansas? I would have been like, you kidding me? Like, no, it's, that's, that's not a thing. And uh, no, it, it all worked out because like I said, I met Marie and now we have two great stepkids and uh, I adjunct at uh, University of Arkansas and, and at NWAC. Okay, great. <clears throat> yeah, wow. Man, that's a whole other level of questions. And because I was like, hmm, I wonder what it's like for him being <laughs> from Florida, teaching over here in Arkansas, learning about our state. You know what I'm saying? That's a whole other, a whole other level of you being... Uh, from the northeast like that wow what what's that what's that been like for you to pick up on uh, i get um you're not from around here a lot um uh very polite you know um <clears throat> I've, I've i found it's a little bit of a challenge um uh, the northerners i'm from are a little bit more circumspect and you know um uh, less talkative less public affection oriented um and uh then going up in a big city you know uh Orlando is like 800,000 people. And then you come to Fayetteville, which is like 50,000 people. And then Russellville, which is like 20. 
and my kids go to the Dover, Dover School District, which is like 1,000 people. So it, the sheer size of everything has been has been challenging, and also just navigating. Um, I, I've been told I'm curt a lot, or that I'm, um, uh, you know, very kind of. Uh, not gregarious, I suppose. Um, uh, not as warm as some many Southerners are. So I come off I come off as more hostile than I intend to be, uh, but it's just because I'm a I, I tend to be a person of few words. Yeah, man, that's um, that's awesome. That's a that's a diverse background. You know, I'm fascinated by a friend of mine, Neil Harrington. He's an artist, and uh, he works at, at Arkansas Tech. He's runs the art gallery there, and is an art professor. <clears throat> and he comments. He's from um south dakota right oh, wow. yeah if i'm not mistaken he's from that part of the country and he is uh comments on he does a lot of art of things he sees is uh indigenous to the south mm-hmm. you know and he's like i'm i'm able to see different things that southern artists don't see because i'm not from here and i was like oh that's interesting like it um <clears throat> was that how did you choose your topic of like uh your master's, uh, well, yeah, let's just get into your master's thesis was uh, St. Augustine is a test case for Stephen and Ash's Civil War occupation model? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, was, I went to uh, uh, the master's program uh, right as the Great Recession hit. So all the funds dro- uh, dro- um, sort of dried up. I was working a couple of d- jobs. Uh, that's when I got uh, started at the Institute of Simulation and Training. And so I just needed a topic that was close by. And for growing up, I was more fascinated with World War II history or Napoleonic history. Ooh, yeah. But I lack the language skills necessary to get into those archives. You know, if you want to do Napoleonic warfare or you know, World War I or World War II, you need a master German, French, Russian, and a whole host of other dialects. And I, I just don't have that ability, to be honest. No. So I was like, okay, um, something nearby Orlando, something historical, and I just kind of decided that the Civil War would be a good place to go. And St. Augustine, uh, I had realized, just did not get a lot of um, uh, study uh, specifically related to its Civil War experience. You know, St. Augustine is, has been under five different flags, I think it is. It's what, yeah. um, the Spanish, uh, the uh, British, the Americans, the Confederates, and then the Americans again, if you count that. Um and it also has a very unique population. There is a lot of Menorcans there. And a Menorcan is a, an a island off the coast of Italy that the British took over um, yeah. during this, uh, one of the uh, many imperialistic wars. And so they brought over, there were a lot of Menorcans living in, in St. Augustine. And uh, it's also a very multicultural area. It's an area which defies easy racial categor- categorization. Um, oftentimes, Northerners will come down and be like, why is that white person enslaved? And they're like, oh, that's not a white person. That's a, you know, a mix of an African-American and a Menorcan and a Native American. And Northerners didn't see those racial, that could not um, go through that racial geography easily. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the whole point is that um, I needed something close by. I realized St. Augustine hadn't been worked on a lot. So I decided to look at the occupation. And what I found that fascinated me was that the regiments, Union regiments, were all acting differently towards the St. Augustinians, and some of them were friendly towards white Southerners. Others were more uh, hostile towards white Southerners. Um, some were nice to African, Southern African Americans. So I asked, you know, why is this? And what I came to find is, uh, well, one, the occupation model worked, and it's a good way of looking at military occupation in general. But two, I decided that I needed to figure out why these regiments from, from all over New England, so two regiments from New Hampshire, two regiments from Connecticut, a regiment from Massachusetts and a regiment from New York, they all acted differently. And when I went into these letters, I found it came down to their politics. The New Hampshire regiments mm-hmm. had more Democrats in them. And New Hampshire had been a, a bastion of, de- of the democracy of the Northern Democratic Party since its founding in the 1830s. In fact, often New Hampshire was called the South Carolina of the North or oh, the Gibraltar of the democracy because they were just so hardcore in favor of protecting slavery. Um, they were a centerpiece to Jackson's administration. He had two New Hampshire politicians. You remember Franklin Pierce, he uh, becomes president. He's from New Hampshire. And every step of the way, New Hampshire is just doggedly resistant towards any discussion of emancipation or 
even anti-slavery. I mean, abolitionists are just beaten up in the state every time they come there. And so it's like a no-go. And then the 1850s, things kind of change. You have this influx of Irish immigrants. And so cultural issues become more important than the old class issues of the Jackson coalition. And what you find is that um, there's a switch in the 1850s where the Republicans take control of the state. But the Democrats are still very powerful there. They're still an active um, part of that, um, of that political process. And so they volunteer for the war in large numbers because many of them are poor. Um, there's a series of economic depressions that lead many men to, resi- uh, to enlist. But you also end up finding that um, they're enrolling in this war, but they disagree about it. They're fighting, but they disagree about what the war aims are. They're disagreeing about the conduct of the war. And it becomes this running political battle in New Hampshire to the point that uh, I realized from my dissertation, I had to explore this more just on New Hampshire, not the other units, but just these New Hampshire uh, units because they were so different from one another. And what I came to find is that like in the middle of this war, this great civil war, New Hampshire newspapers were arguing in favor of the biblical sanctity of slavery. Imagine that, it's 1864, the Emancipation Proclamation has been passed and these Northern Democratic editors are saying the same taglines that Southern slavery apologists say. And I said, all right, I need to figure out what is going on here. For real. Yeah. Oh man, that's uh, that sounds like that was like a Pandora's box. So you just like rolled that over into your dissertation. Yes, yes. So what my, my thesis was several different regiments in St. Augustine. And so what I did was I focused on my dissertation for the 4th New Hampshire. And I did that because they, they were, quote, suspected of being a Democratic regiment. So they were suspected of being Democratic. What does that mean? Why is that an issue for this Republican governor and this Republican uh, authority figures in New Hampshire? And what I found is like they're, they're Uh, mistreated at every turn they're not given weapons uh, when they leave the state and even when they do they're given the really bad ones it's a belgian uh type of pattern um they're not trained at all um they are rushed into service and then they're kind of just thrown into what's called the department of the south which is a a military region that stretches from the coast of south carolina down to key west florida and so they're in the backwaters there's constant news stories headed back to New Hampshire about how terrible these guys are. I mean, they are depicted as drunks, as rowdy, um, boisterous um, men. With no, uh, the, the officers are depicted as either incompetent or as corrupt. There is court martials left and right. There are fights. Um, it, it gets so bad that at one point, there's like an entire company of Irishmen in the 4th New Hampshire who come from Manchester um, that they get so drunk in Jacksonville that the rest of the regiment has to like put like you know fix their bayonets and force these guys to surrender because they're in the middle of this this drunken yahoo um in the midst of jacksonville and that type of behavior continues uh in saint augustine this is one of my favorite stories so they're in saint augustine for a while they are occupying the city they're fairly nice towards white southerners and they are very cruel towards african americans who are, are refugees escaping slavery and um, these uh, series of uh, Irish companies, um, which about three of them, they are tired of paying high prices to a sutler. A sutler is a supply guy, a guy who um, basically gets a, uh, a permission from the U.S. government to sell goods uh, in whatever region they're in. Well, these guys are tired of paying high prices, so they just rob him blind. They just take all of his whiskey and about $700 worth of other merchant goods. And then they embark on a two to three day bender where they are just robbing liquor from all over the city. They are knocking down African-Americans, brawling with other soldiers, but then the whiskey runs out. Okay, you would think it would end there, but no, then they start boarding little boats. They go out into the middle of St. Augustine Harbor so that they can steal liquor off of the ship, this merchant ship that's in the middle of the harbor. Uh, And finally they run out of that liquor and then the whole thing peters out. There's a series of court martials about it, but I just found like, This is just not the typical regiment you hear about. When you talk about Northern regiments in the Civil War, it's all happy-go-lucky and they're okay towards African-Americans and there's not that much dissension. But what I found is that the 4th New Hampshire is just, it's opportunistic officers, it's drunken men, it's intemperate officers. It's just a whole god-awful mess. And that is why they were the last regiment to get their unit history in New Hampshire in 1913. 
40 plus years, 50 years after the end of the war, they're the last unit to get their regimental history. I said, why is that? Because of their conduct. Wow. I'm going to put, okay, so now in my head, it's going to be Chamberlain and uh, Round Top and this unit. That's going to be the scale <laughs> yes. for Civil War units. That'll be the spectrum. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That is super interesting, man, for sure. So did you get, um, this is a part of your PhD program. Did you get another master's degree from tech? Did I see you take like, uh, I, I was just like researching your name and stuff. I saw that you took like some com some comprehensive exams or something a few years back at U of A. Yeah. So, um, the, the PhD process is you, um, and they, they don't, they need to be more clear about this, but you enter into the program and then you do about two years of coursework. And then at the end, uh, end of that coursework, you take an exam, like you said, comprehensive exams. It's a two week long process whereby you're pretty much tested on every book you've ever read. And so that's several hundred books. Um, you are, um, they send you something at 8 a.m. on a Monday, and then you have two days to write um, four questions, which is usually at about 20 to 25 pages a piece. So you're writing over 100 pages uh, within a two day period, period of time. Like handwriting. Uh, no, no, no. They, they let you type it up now. Oh, um, great. Great. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Though for my master's, they lock you in a room and they make you type it. At least uh, now they let you do this at home. So anyway, you do this exam, you pass, then you're called ABD, all but dissertation. And then from there, you have to write the darn thing, which takes the most amount of time. So it took me, I guess, three years to write the dissertation on top of the uh, two years of coursework or whatever. So how, how much... Um from the whole program like how long did you go to U of A beginning to end I think it was about uh seven years total I think seven years total um nice. there's a couple extra years in there where I was doing research um uh New Hampshire is a, a funky place to research because they're the one state that does not put their newspapers up online they do not take part in the library of congress newspaper project which, dig which digitizes all these items and to this day, they do not require the governors to keep their papers uh, in state archives. So I could not get a number of governor's letters or papers from the Civil War era. I couldn't get their newspaper. So I had to go there myself and go through all of their very, very old card catalog selections, which was, it was, it, it was entertaining and enjoyable, but a lot of work. So it's not as easy as uh, studying some other subjects to say the least. Yeah, man, that's, I can't imagine. Have you have you gotten into? I mean, I'm sure you have a little bit, but have you gotten into anything with Arkansas history since you've been living here? Um, I have uh, been invited to do a few talks, though COVID kind of um, uh, messed it up. But I was going to do some work with the Civil War Roundtable of Arkansas uh, because there is some really interesting stuff at the Battlefield Preservation of Pea Ridge, which mm -hmm. my advisor, Dr. Sutherland, says is the single greatest preserved battlefield in the American West, um, if not in the entire country, in terms of it doesn't have a lot of monuments. It's all pretty much pristine in the way it was in 1862. Yeah. Um, and I have tried to get involved with editing some local historical journals, but no, I haven't really gotten to do as much Arkansas history as I should, um, especially compared to my wife, who is who's the expert on that. She is great, man. She's so smart. Like, she, smart. like it, it really does. Like, when I talk to her, I, I always feel stupid afterwards. I know that's crazy to say, but I'm like, man, I got to I gotta do better. Like, that, it's kind of one of those. But, she makes uh, me feel stupid, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's great, man. That's, that's the type of conversations I'm trying to have, honestly. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, I'm in an Arkansas history. I'm given a test from I'm in quarantine right now. So I'm given a, a territorial history exam uh, mm -hmm. this week. So it's been uh, I've been down in a rabbit hole right before uh, we started podcasting. That's what I wrapped up doing. <laughs> what all classes do you uh, have you been teaching as an adjunct like just throughout your time? Uh, so uh, the bread and butter for an instru adjunct instructor is the surveys. Um, so I teach the US-1, the US-2 survey. And I've also taught both sections of world civilization, um, which can be really fascinating. Um, I've taught colonial American history and revolutionary oh, American history. Oh, wow, nice. And um, I have taught global military history um, from the ancient era to today, which is a really hard class to teach. Um, at tech, for instance, the military history class is just American military history, right? 
So, mm. you know, start with the colonial period and end with today. Global military history, you start with primates at war and ants at war going all the way up to uh, the current uh, international troubles and everything. So it's a, it's a huge course, but it's also one of the most rewarding courses I've ever taught. Um, Do you get into the Assyrians any at all in that yeah. particular course? Yes, yes. Um, I, one of the great, the theme of every single course I teach is memory versus history. The idea of what have you been told in the past? Is it really history or is it the memory of the past? Yeah. And with, with military history, that's really prevalent, right? Like people love the movie 300. And so Troy. Inaccurate. Right, and Troy, so inaccurate. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But the Assyrian war machine, oh my gosh, man. The Assyrian war machine is just the next, is just on another level. And when you break it down, uh, the sheer ferocity of their tactics, the sheer devastation that they laid, like mountains of skulls outside of defeated cities. Um, they pioneer combined arms. They are the finest siege uh, crafters um, that the world had at that time. Um, they were feared by everyone. Um, and yet somehow they just kind of get snuffed out and we still don't exactly know how. Um, uh, it's uh, they are um, an, a, a fascinating case study of an entire society geared towards one thing, and that's combat. Um, so yeah, I, I love the Assyrians. Yeah, me too. Honestly, yeah, <clears throat> I am. Um, I'm like turnover. I'm like in my Civ one course. I'm right to the point where I'm transitioning from the Assyrians to the Neo Babylonians. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was lecturing about them today. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, man, that's um. That's got to be a cool course to teach, if I'm not mistaken. And he he does stuff with ROTC, but McCool from uh, – he's the other historian. He may teach that class at Tech. Uh, he does a few things with Tech yeah. for the the people that, that are in ROTC that need real specific credits. I think he might teach a, that course you mentioned, but I'll have to ask him. Cool. Um, well, so like uh, – you just kind of decided at one point to, to get a PhD. Did you, did you mention what the transition was like on that? Like, when did you just decide to, that you were going to go all in, man? That seems like a, a big choice to make. I grew up loving history. Um, I, I mean, I played Civilization two. I played Age of Empires one. you know? Um, if, there was a I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. if there was a historical game, I played it um, to this day. A Total War series is my favorite. Um, and so I always loved it. And my family always instilled a love of learning in me. Uh, they were always encouraging me to read and to engage with uh, intellectualist traditions, which, again, something different than in certain parts of the South or even the North or West, you know, uh, intellectualism was looked down upon sometimes. Um, so I always had this positive influence, right? And my family has a very rich history as well that I was always like sort of told about. Like my family fled the Bolsheviks in Russia. You know, one of our relatives was lined up against the wall and nearly shot by the Bolsheviks. We fled the Nazis in Germany. We fled B Bishop William Loud and uh, Charles I in England. Um, my great-great-grandfather, uh, he uh, was an English soldier who was gassed in the First World War and then married an Irish woman in the midst of the Irish Civil War and then had to flee. So we have all this history, which always fascinated me. And so uh, obviously I was going to get my BA on it, in it, and then my master's as well. And like I said, I was working in curriculum development and I loved what I was doing. I was working with first responders and the military on, on how to best teach dig, uh, do, you know, digital curriculums. Uh, but the money was just drying up. Uh, Congress and you know, politics and blah, blah, blah. Um, there just weren't were a lot of grants coming in. So I made the decision like, all right, it's time to transition over to, the, to academia again. Um, and I, uh, in a way, I regret the decision because ap academia is just a dumpster fire in terms of job prospects, but it's super rewarding as well because I've got to mold the minds of several hundred young men and women and now. I've met a, an amazing partner in Marie and our, and our beautiful stepchildren, uh, my stepchildren, and um, it's, uh, the decision basically was of monetary need and then it just grew into a whole world. And I was just committed to seeing it through to the end. It became so difficult. You know, it's uh, you're working for poverty wages, um, teaching, uh, doing research, um, uh, have a commuting back and forth. But it was um, th that's what got me into it and, and what made me sustain it. It's just the, the love of the subject, just the complexity and the nuance and the stories. And it just, obviously all the books behind me. It's just uh, I love reading. It's just hard to it's hard. It's a passion. 
um, that is hard to relate. It's just, it's in my soul, you know? Yeah. And so one day I may have to leave academia if the whole thing comes crashing down because of COVID and because of uh, just the way administration is running the whole system. But um, it, it's been an amazing experience for the time I've been around. Man, it is. Um, <clears throat> I know so a lot of people who, I mean, I'm very fortunate in, in securing, I mean, I work at a community college. I teach Arkansas history and then all of the intro sections you mentioned, US 1 and 2, Civ 1 and 2. But um, man, I know so many people that are like yourself or Marie or they're in a, they're in a PhD program and their prospects like, A, they're smarter than me. B, they're teaching upper level courses, like you mentioned, like colonial history and American Revolution. I assume those are like senior level, 4,000 level courses. Um, and getting paid a starvation wage. Like, let's be real here. I mean, adjunct pay is, is not good. Um, I know because when I teach an overload, they pay me like they pay an adjunct. I'm like, no, no, no. It should be $7,000. That's what I say to a man. I'm like, what are we doing here? You want me to teach extra, but you don't want to pay? Anyway, but yeah, I feel, I mean, like, I, it's a weird uh, situation. So like, what are your, what are your plans for you? I know you kind of mentioned the, the maybe some uncertainties, but like, are, are are your prospects of the future trying to stay in the state? Do you think you'll have to move? What do you, what do you think? Um, I'm keeping all prospects open. Um, we have a custody agreement that we're abiding to. And so as of, you know, for now we're here um, and I will adjunct as long as I can. Um, COVID has, it used to be when you got your PhD, you were expected to find a tenure track position as quickly as possible. Otherwise you're a failure. Now, because of COVID, they're willing to let you adjunct for a little while longer and not just view you as a failure if you don't get that job. But um, right, as of right now, it's just a keep, matter of keeping prospects open. Uh, I will go where I need to go, uh, work for whoever I have to work for in order to you know, provide for my family. Uh, but in reality, you know, I, and I have no problem saying this, I'm just another white male his Civil War historian. You know, there's a million of us. Um, whereas Marie is the, the wave of the future, you know, a female scholar of massive resistance in, in the Cold War, um, that's, uh, she's going to go far. And so I will support her in any way I can. And maybe one day we move, maybe not, you know, it's, it, we will see where the future takes us. Yeah, that's, that's a great attitude to have. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, to just like, I mean, I've done similar things like with my business here in Russellville, um, with building my business while at least getting two masters through master's degree <clears throat> in my education. But just based off everything you've told me and based off what little I know about you. And I think it's valuable to the audience to hear this sort of stuff <clears throat> about like the sacrifice involved. Like you live in Russellville or, or in the area of Pope County, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. U of A is in Northwest of Fayetteville in Northwest Arkansas exit what 67 on, <clears throat> on 540. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what, what has that sacrifice been like for you? Uh, so I, yeah, um, I, I guess a lot of time I used to commute 12 hours a week, um, at least. So two hours up, two hours down three to four times a week, sometimes five times a week. Um, and so, you know, waking up at 4 a.m., taking the kids to their grandma's, driving the two plus hours up at the, you know, while it's still dark outside, uh, listening to podcasts along the way, teaching seven classes and then driving back at night and still being expected to, you know, do all the dad stuff, play Monopoly and, you know, do the dishes and cook dinner and all that, which I love doing. I love spending time with my family. Um, but then that's not even including reading, you know, for, or revising lectures, right. Or making tests or grading, right. I, so, you know, I grade, you know, uh, average. So I, what, I just had uh, my students do a podcast analysis. So out of my seven classes, that's somewhere around 240 papers I'm going to grade this week. So 240 two page papers. And then I'm also expected to, you know, be the family. You, man you have 240 students. Um, uh, so if the seven classes broken up by about 40 students each, um, oh. or I, I can know a couple of those classes are around 20, uh, some of them 10. So, but yeah, I, ha I have a lot of students. <laughs> I don't, man, so I lament that I have to, like, with my, I have 300 members at my gym, and then I have 150 average students. Mm -hmm. 
as a full-time professor at USCCM, that's crazy that you have that many as an adjunct at U of A. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, so yeah, that, um, I've been, I've been doing the commuting for about three or four years, I guess now. Uh, so whatever four years times 12 hours a week plus, uh, and then add to that all the extra time for grading and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to manage, but at the same time, this is the system, you know? And a lot of my colleagues would complain. I'm just happy to have a job, man. I am just, I'm ecstatic to be able to teach history every day. I go in and just, I'm happy that I get to talk about salutary neglect. I'm happy that I get to tell my students how Patrick um, uh, Thomas Paine hated the absolute living guts out of uh, George Washington, right? Um, it, it makes it all worthwhile. And even if it's just, you know, peanuts i'm happy to get those peanuts you know it is it's a passion thing man that's uh for the longest time i was <clears throat> doing everything i wanted to do and i was like destitutely broke you know for the longest i mean all the way until i was probably 30 years old like and <clears throat> i just kept working towards it i was also I just talked to a guy the other day that's like a famous, I mean, he's famous to me. He has like videos that get 20 million views. He's a famous bass player. He's 28 years old. <clears throat> and it, but he's essentially just busking in the street and doing Facebook lives and getting paid pretty decently uh, through videos. But it's like, it, there's for all three of us, there's that passion element. It's like, I'm the same way. It's like, it, it really wouldn't matter if I was still broke living in my apartment the the importance is that i get to do the things that make me happy you know yeah i think one of the things i recognize about our society that you know it, it could be good it could be bad depending on your attitude we're obsessed with wealth where uh, our job defines us in a lot of ways and that's that's okay you know i come from a family where hard work is expected and where we identify ourselves by our jobs but um a lot of people just do stuff for the paycheck and I do respect that because at the end of the day, you need that money, you know, you, you got to take care of people, but we should be more inclined towards loving. It's okay to be an artist. It's okay to be a writer. It's okay to be a teacher. If you love those things and do it well, then more power to you. And it doesn't matter if you make, you know, dirt pay, as long as you're enjoying yourself and you're able to provide, then that's, that's what matters. So you, you had that family support thrown behind you to do all this, huh? That was Yes, not everyone is that way. You know, I know I have a lot of friends who come from families who think that they're failures because they're PhD students or because they have a PhD. It's like, oh, you're just a professor. You could be making $80,000 as an electrician. Well, yeah, yeah, you're technically correct. I also don't have to worry about getting shocked every day or, or losing a finger to, to something. Um, I'll be, you know, if I'm cutting tests or whatever, I could do that to myself, I suppose. Um, but yes, I have been extremely fortunate in the outpouring of support from my family. And even if they don't agree with me, they are still behind me 100%. Um, and that's uh, worth more than anything else in the world. Mm. You've, and I just may have seen about this, but you've worked other jobs along the way as well, right? I, yeah, like um, I worked for Sprint for a hot minute. I, I worked as, um, do you remember Circuit City? Yeah. <laughs> I worked as like one of the guys who moved TVs around at Circuit City, wow. you know, just like stocking the shelves. But then I, I got into curriculum development and grant writing. And um, so I, I did work a little bit in the pri in private sector. Marie has way more experience than me there. You know, she was a, a waitress and a number of other things for, for a large part of her life. I've been fortunate where I didn't have to uh, work so many, uh, I guess what you would call it minimum wage jobs. Like that's a bad thing, but it's not, you know, it's just the way it's the stigma we attach to it. But, um, yeah, I, 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 most of my work has been, I'm fortunate enough in some type of academia. Um, and I was really molded by my, uh, real, uh, my mentor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ron Tarr at, uh, Institute of Simulation and Training. And, uh, he was a guy who helped pioneer the usage of simulation in uh, military training. Um, and so I learned a lot about distance learning and how to properly develop curriculums, how to write grants. And it's a lot of experience that has translated very well to both the private and the academic sphere. Um, Cause there are a lot of parallels. And I try and tell my students these things like email etiquette will save your job. Being able to properly cite something 
we'll get you a job. I got my first job because I was able to write and cite. And that is something that was valuable to, to my company at the time. And so my classes uh, in my f teaching philosophy is about giving those students those professional skills. You know, I'm not worried if they're going to remember the exact date that the pilgrims founded Plymouth. But if they are able to critically read stuff, be able to cite it and make themselves reasonably understood and conduct themselves in a professional format, I've done my job. And that all comes from being an academic, but also trying to translate it to real world skills that they can, they can use to have a prosperous life. Yeah, man. Nice. Nice. Uh, so last question. Um, do you have any planned uh, publications or anything that you're working on or is a goal for the future of something that you would like to work on? I am, um, I'm putting together a panel for the Southern Historical Association with uh, Dr. Madeline Forrest Ramsey at the Virginia Military Institute and with Mr. Ian Davis at um, Mississippi State. And we're gonna do a panel on military occupation. And we have uh, Dr. Lorian Foote as our, as our panel lead. And so she wrote a great, give me one second here. If I can find it. Uh, I always have my books nearby. Uh, she wrote this amazing book called The Gentleman in the Roughs, which is about dissension in the Union Army and class conflict. So the gentlemen are basically using the tools of uh, military um, discipline to enforce their sense of masculinity and their class values upon lower class um, individuals. So she is our panel chair. Uh, we have our first commentator as Sandra Manning, who is an expert on you know, the politics of emancipation and uh, why the war was fought over slavery and Northern views of that. Uh, and we have Dr. Holly Pinheiro, who writes on uh, USCT troops, the United States Colored Troops, um, as another commentator. And so we are all going to be looking at different aspects of military occupation. Um, I'm going to look at my rowdy Irishmen who, uh, who are anti-abolitionists and Democrats who just uh, do not abide or do not agree with the war effort. Uh, Dr. Forrest is going to be, or uh, Dr. Forrest Ramsey is going to be looking at how Union troops got along really well with white Southerners in Farquhar County, Virginia. And Mr. Davis is going to be looking at the experience of the USCT troops in the Department of the Gulf, which is the area from basically the Florida Panhandle over to the coast of Texas. Um, so it's a, we're, we're looking forward to that panel. Um, I'm trying to take my dissertation and craft it into a book proposal, uh, which will follow the 4th New Hampshire throughout the entire war, um, because they do spend a lot of time in the Department of the South, but then they're transferred to Virginia, and they serve at the Battle of the Crater, and so they're massacred in that crater, you know, when they run into it, uh, though they have a very negative view of the Black troops that they serve alongside of. They end up getting butchered at Drury's Bluff, and finally they fight at Fort Fisher, one of the last battles of the war in North Carolina, where um, the colonel falls, uh, uh, Colonel Lewis Bell, who in him in himself is an interesting cat. I'll talk about that later more if you want. Um, so I want to do that. And I also have all these letters from my soldiers to their wives, um, my Civil War soldiers to their wives. And they are beautifully written letters of love, but also of, you know, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm running out of food. I'm running out of money. Um, women are openly sharing their political opinions with their husbands. And the husbands aren't saying, oh, you're a woman, you can't say that. They're saying, honey, I'm in the middle of the war. Can we not fight, fight about the causes of the war, please? Like, I don't, I don't wanna do this right now. I'm in the middle of something. Um, and I wanna turn that into like, you know, maybe a little coffee table book or something just about relationships of North, North, uh, New Englanders or Granite Staters and their wives um, and what that can tell us about gender and sexuality in New England. And I will say one thing, hopefully this doesn't offend any of your audience, but my, um, my, the colonel of my regiment, uh, Louis Bell, likes to be called a little boy by his wife. He kind of has a fetish about it. And um, so it is this one part where he says, can you imagine your little boy is the commander of a great fort about to destroy the city if it's at my whim? And can you imagine that your, that your sweet, lovable little boy, he just goes on and on and on about this. It's... Um, it's interesting, uh, probably an interesting article about uh, sexuality in New England. That was, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> man, that's what's that's what I love about history, and w one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about what you know, how you got into the, what you chose to do your research on, is that there in academia there is that idea that like, hey, find something that hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then that spins off in other directions too. And it's, it's always, uh, it's always fascinating to hear about that. Cause I mean, none of this stuff, you know, usually uh, I haven't thought of it, but uh, you know, a lot of people haven't. So it's, I mean, it, Civil War history, there's about 100,000 books on it, at least, right? And yet there's still something new. I mean, I'm the first historian to talk about the 4th New Hampshire in over 100 years. Um, and, that, and that's crazy when you think about it. And it's also one of my perennial disappointments with Civil War history is keep talking about the same things. It's always Lee's Army or Grant or the Army of the Tennessee. No one talks about the Department of the South. No one talks about the Department of the Gulf um, or... Uh, how uh, various um, northerners are just absolutely disgusted with the conflict um yeah. it's uh if you don't mind i want to tell a little story about yeah, go ahead, please. And so uh in new england uh in new hampshire and spe uh, specifically there was so much animosity towards lincoln administration that um it looked as if new hampshire would go over towards the democrats in the midst of the war and in fact, they won, they uh, narrowly won an election in 1863, but because it didn't have a clear majority, it went to the House of Representatives, uh, the State House of Representatives, which then found for the Republicans. So what they do the next year is they engineer a manufactured third party run by a war Democrat, a war Democrat to siphon off votes from the peace Democrats in the state. And then they begin selectively furloughing units home. So they're picking and choosing which regiments to send home to vote. And they make sure it's only Republican regiments that do it. The Democratic regiments like mine isn't allowed to come back and vote. Uh, and on top of that, uh, they begin prosecuting army officers who disagree with the war effort. So there's a guy called Lieutenant Andrew Jackson Ever Edgerly, who he, all he does is he's in New Hampshire recruiting. And he decides on election day, he's gonna go vote for the Democrats. And he does it very loudly and he tells everyone they should do it too. The secretary of war, Edwin Stanton, cashiers him from service merely for voting as a Democrat. And it basically, he says, um, uh, the, the local Senator of New Hampshire says uh, in a letter to him, like, we are all saved by fire, all of us. You need to do something about this guy. And so he cashiers him from the service saying that he is supporting copperheads and traitors in New England, in, 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 in uh, New Hampshire. It isn't until 1888 that his name is cleared and he is reinstated to the army. And what the Senate says in 1888 is we can all look back on this now and laugh over the idea that voting Democrat meant that you were a traitor. And that's really what my dissertation really kind of wanted to get at was how partisan politics derailed the war effort and was so divisive that we don't even realize it to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people look at our modern politics and say, how did we ever get here? Here I am looking back at the 1860s you know, uh, and being like, if we couldn't get our stuff together in a great civil war, what chance do we have now? Like uh, dissension yeah. in party politics has been a facet of, American, of the American experience since the founding. Yeah, yeah, man, that's and that's such a good point too. I'm fascinated by the Trans Mississippi and, and just like this region, not just in Arkansas. One thing I would like to learn more about is uh, Missouri mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and things that went on there with um, election rigging and ballot boxes and just different things I've read in passing. And it then being a slave state that that is a border state that didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. it, it's just all very fascinating uh, to think about. There, so there's one, this doesn't actually cover electoral stuff, but if you ever want a good, the single best uh, history of um, a military campaign uh, in the Trans-Mississippi is uh, Earl uh, William L. Shays and Earl Hess's P. Ridge Civil War Campaign in the West, written in, I believe it was 1993. And um, one, they do an amazing job just showing the connection between Missouri and Arkansas in the war. Um, but you are absolutely right. Missouri is a fascinating concept. And um, there's a, a, a former colleague of mine, Matt Stith, S-T-I-T-H, and he's written a book on uh, the Trans-Mississippi as proof that the Civil War was a total war. You know, no holds barred, uh, executing civilians, war crimes, the whole bag. Um, and there's a lot of great research on that. I believe uh, Dr. Sutherland, my advisor, has written a book on guerrilla warfare uh, which uh, highlights the experience of Missouri, as you said. Um, 
And so, I mean, the Trans Mississippi, thankfully, is finally getting the attention it deserves because it was regarded as a backwater up until 10, 20 years ago, really, and is now finally getting the scholarship it deserves. But if I may say uh, one more point about what you made, uh, the comment you made about uh, rigging in elections, that's the fascinating thing about elections prior to, you know, the, the 1900s is just how rigged they were. You know, it's, um, there's a book uh, by Mark Summers called The Blundering Generation uh, and another book by him called Party Games. And it's all about just the crazy fraud that American elections had um, where you, you know, you have the whiskey wagon. Um, you, you get the wagon full of whiskey, you go into town, you get a bunch of guys drunk, then you unleash them on the town to vote several times uh, at multiple polling places to fight their opponents in the street in a gigantic grunt, uh, drunken brawl. Um, and it really does show you that politics has changed a lot. Uh, it went from a public spectacle to a very private affair uh, where we have this myth that we, there's a lot of in-person voting when it's, it's nothing compared to the, to the antebellum and post-war experience. Yeah. Man, this is all fascinating stuff, dude. I could, uh, I could talk about it all day for sure. It's, um, and it's been great. It's been great chatting with you today, man. Um, you, and you've recommended some great books. So I don't even, like I always usually ask well, mo most guests, uh, I ask, uh, I'm like, Hey, what's a book recommendation? I've done about 75 books for this year and I'm trying to hit a hundred. Um, yeah. But uh, it's uh, I do I do a lot of audio books, so it's been uh, it's been great. Any other books you want to recommend before we wrap it up? Uh, I don't know, man. I got I got way too many. <laughs> the site. Um, oh, okay. Han, real quick. <clears throat> so um, a great example again of a unit that gets a bad rap is Leslie Gordon's um, A Broken Regiment, the 16th Connecticut Civil War. Sorry. And it's an amazing book about how um, units are mistreated during the war or they, maybe they suffer a reversal. Um, some, you know, uh, they, they're just on the wrong end of the battlefield and they end up getting whipped. Uh, and then they're just absolutely trashed at home. Like the, at home, the home front is just so politicized that they are just trying to find any excuse to tear down the Lincoln administration or to, to say that McClellan is a terrible general. And this regiment um, suffers badly in a battle and then gets captured and sent to Andersonville. And their history oh. is basically forgotten, yet it's not told because they have so much shame and they are so maligned on the home front that these men don't get the honor they deserve. Um, and you see that a lot with every war, honestly. Um, I just didn't realize how politicized the Civil War was until I actually got into the research and seeing that they reduce the conduct of regiments down to, oh, well, that's a German regiment, so that's why they did badly. Or, oh, that's an Irish regiment, that's why they're all drunks. Or, oh, that's a democratic regiment, that's why they treat African-Americans poorly. Um, it, it begins to showcase that perception often trumps reality, that the image that we have of an opponent, the construct that we've given them, how we pigeonhole them with that title, uh, affects the way that we look at them. Because the 4th New Hampshire, my unit, is not overly democratic. It's not overly Irish. But the perception mattered more than the reality. And that perception meant that they were treated differently than other units of the same state. And you see that across the board in this war and in other conflicts as well, all the way up to the modern era. Think about the way that we talk about Trumpers or, or Democrats in this I country. Know I was thinking about that. I was. It's uh, And that... Uh, we are all influenced by our era. I mean, it's no mistake that I did a, uh, an occupation study during the Iraq war. I was like, why, like, where's occupation policy come from? I wanna know this, that's what led to my thesis. And I saw the, the disgruntled politics that we have today and said, this is the first time it's happened. The answer is no, it was even worse in the civil war. Um, so at the end of the day, you can sleep well, realizing that there's continuity in American history, but then you can also stay up late at night saying, is modeling our political behavior the same way as during a great civil war? Is that, is that what really what we should be aiming for? And I'd say probably not. I would have to agree. <laughs> Certainly. Can I ask, can I ask you a question? Yeah, by all means, please. Um, <clears throat> what's your podcast setup? I've been looking to start my own podcast and I'm curious about, you have a very clean sound and everything. How do you get, how do you get that? Man, on this one today, I'm just using a, a basic Blue Yeti. That's all I've got right here. Um, 
outside of that, I use um, a Tascam mixing board uh, over here. It's the Model 24. Okay. It, it's kind of advanced, but you know, it just does like I started doing live music and stuff on the podcast once a month. I've done, I've had a full band come in, then I had a, a solo artist, Ryan Harmon, come in. And uh, my guitar teacher, I take guitar lessons. Um, I played for like 20 years, but he, he runs sound while we do these. But so this board is, it's set up for doing stuff like that. Uh, I could run it as a second audio feed. I'm going to start doing. I joked yesterday on the podcast, uh, I just wanted to start a podcast and then I had to like f over time and becoming an audio video engineer. Yeah. yeah. And, tr and basically run, trying to figure out how to run a TV slash production studio. But, um, you know, I will say, man, Behringer has, if you wanted to go with a traditional microphone setup, mm -hmm. Behringer has some great USB mixers. Mm -hmm. that you can really dial in the sound on. And that's what I did forever. I have two of those. I have one at my office. And if I ever record at my office, I, I usually use that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just creates a really good feed and you can plug it. You can plug a video camera into it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I want to say the little bitty Behringer one I have, which I could do two microphones into and hook that into a computer, mm -hmm. This Blue Yeti, I could set it on the table. I've got another Blue Yeti that's that I hook into the mixer that is like a room mic. I set it, if there's four of us here, I would set it in the middle of the table. This one will do that too, but only hooks into a computer. Mm -hmm. So I really like the Yeti products. And for people starting out, if you don't want to go with a mixer and a microphone, the, the Blue Yeti is awesome. I, I was curious about that because, um, you know, because of COVID, we've now had to record everything to be put online. Yeah. And because of my training with distance education, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm telling you right now, Zoom is going to crash, Blackboard's going to crash, Canvas is going to be able to support all this. So I had to, you know, uh, open up my own podcast on, on, on Red Circle to post all my stuff for my students to ac uh, access. So it was sustainable and accessible. So I started out with a blue Yeti and my problem was I couldn't dial in that sound the way that you did. I kept getting those mouth clicks and like the sound of saliva in your mouth constantly. And, uh, and so I, I decided to move over to a, um, a road podcaster. Mike. Oh, those are great. I've got a, yeah. I've got a road shotgun mic that I use for filming. See simultaneously, I'm building up like three YouTube channels. There's the mm -hmm. podcast. There's, I do put my lectures online for just on my personal YouTube and then my gym YouTube, I have like 700 plus videos. So I usually use a shotgun mic for that, but man, that's what, uh, what is cool is, um, I, I also, hold on. I'll show you. This has been great as well. Um, but this is more for like, uh, I do like, uh, if I want to go mobile, like while you were talking about P Ridge, I was like thinking about all the sites in Arkansas that I'm going to go to and do like, uh, I want to eventually do little documentaries on all of them. It's just like a spinoff of something I can provide for my students in Arkansas history. But, um, eventually I'm going to get a drone and I mean, I, I, you know, I see instead of the collapse of, education i see everything moving to a, a more digital synchronous education like you know it's great i was i was telling uh marie i was talking i, I asked her a question about something uh, this week but i'm t oh i was asking her about quarantine and covid and stuff but um i'm just i don't have to report any leave i'm teaching synchronously from my podcast studio mm -hmm. like this when this happened before my boss who's you know she's she's a little um she's in her sixties. Right. But she's like, you know, are you going to be okay with, with t taking off like your classes? Like she was worried. And I was like, I got it. You know, like I'm, I'm going to go to the studio and I'm going to rock this. Like <laughs> literally don't worry about it. I've been waiting for this. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, you know, road and zoom makes some great products too. I have some, I've, this is, I've had really great luck with Tascam and with the Blue Yeti. You know, this has a pop filter on it, mm -hmm. but um, it could have to do with this mic uh, holder. And it's like, it's got a nice shock filter on it. Mm -hmm. Can you hear anything when I do that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It really did take me a long time to dial the sound in though, man. And like even Tom Morello, the Harvard educated guitar player from Rage Against the Machine, 
he he sets his sound and he marks it and he never moves it yeah he has he will get two pedals before he moves the dial on one of his pedals hmm. right so i j- frequently joke with people because rage against the machine comes on all the time while we're doing jujitsu and i'm like this is a sound of harvard education will buy you <laughs> ladies and gentlemen that's that's great uh, um so you um I, I was uh, I did sort of what you were talking about before I had the blue menu just going uh, Yeti going straight into the computer but then now I run it through uh, it's the scarlet it's the um, uh, audio interface um, yeah but then that hooks into uh, the DBX uh, 286s or whatever because I a little bit of a perfectionist I hate the mouth noises and everything which happens with my, my, my speaking style uh, and so I've finally been able to dial in the sound but it's um, I justified the expenditure by saying what exactly what you said. This is the future. You know, what we have had with higher education in the past is, is going to move. It won't maybe crash, but certainly creating more sustainable, accessible digital content uh, that will appeal to audiences, I think, is really the future. And that's, that's why it's great to learn this technology and, to, and, to, and utilize it to get to new audiences. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I, that's... Uh... I do think that's the direction we're headed. And man, there's, there's so many great digital resources out there mm-hmm. that I, that I use to teach with. I'm just like, Oh, this is just another way for me to reach people. Cause some people, um, they like, I mean, I'm that way, man, like digital multimedia diverse, like in blackboard, you should see, I go overboard, man. I'm like, okay, here's the audio lecture. Here's the video lecture. I mean, I'm still going to give the lecture in purpose in person. I want you to come to it. Uh, but then here's my lecture notes. Here's the PowerPoint. Uh, here's yeah. the discussion board that's associated mm-hmm. with all of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, I really I try and slide. I'm like, how can I reappropriate this this information? Oh, I could do a screen share where I just go over the PowerPoint. It won't be the same as the lecture or the lecture notes. It'll be different. You know, it'll be a little shorter, but I, I, I really like to mix that up. And man, I think that is more the, more the direction we're headed is, is really just having a, because man, for multiple uh, intelligences, I'm an audio, audio learner myself, an auditory learner. There's no coincidence. I listened to 75 audio books this year, you right. know? Right. But I've got, I'm I, on the other side of this computer, I got books stacked up everywhere and two shelves myself. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's, that's cool. Um, it, one of the things I did and something to think about for your own classes is how to make students engage with history beyond just with what we provide. And so for my military history class, they had a semester long project where they had a, um, a choose a topic, it could be any battle or any general or maybe any weapon uh, system. They would then have to, um, find a podcast, find a book, find an article, find a movie or television show, find a video game so that they're playing, listening, watching, writing and reading history, military history to get the full experience so that they would come away realizing that every single depiction of war they've ever seen is fundamentally wrong. And it cannot, it cannot uh, encapsulate the true horror of combat. Yeah. Man, you know, that's, that's great. Like I was just thinking of us, I I have a lot of times I'll have my students do something with a film Mm -hmm. throughout the semester, like a, it's like this, this rooted in some sort of topic we're talking about. Like I'll give them a list of, of titles for, uh, I've created like a film list for all my class sections. But, you know, one thing I came across the other day that I didn't know was in that film, The Patriot, you mentioned American Revolutionary Leader, um, Mel Gibson, or uh, not Mel Gibson, but the uh, what's uh, the actor's name? He, he plays this character, Tavington, the dragoon, yeah. the guy that's like the, the uh, antithesis of Mel Gibson's character. But he's based on this other guy named Tarleton or Tarleton. Mm-hmm. And man, I was like, the name was almost the same, so much so that I actually like, so I'd read about it and then I was like, I'm going to watch the Patriot and see about yeah. this and then i didn't even connect until three quarters of the way through the movie that it was tavington and torleton like and and there was a lot of like you know this guy didn't die in the war in real life went right. back it i was fascinated but that's that could create some confusion for people mm-hmm. 
history, history versus memory. But again, going back to what I said earlier, um, everything that we've read or watched has misled us in some way. I mean, the idea that there's a, a plantation owner who has freed people working his, his plantation rather than slaves in South Carolina in 1776 is laughable at best. Um, and, you know, um, uh, Mel Gibson's character is loosely based on, I believe it's uh, Morgan uh, and the Swamp Fox of that. Um, of, yep. And like you said, Tarleton or Tavington, however the, the actual name is, not accurate, but I mean, it's, it, that would have been a, a more accurate, I suppose, to the Civil War than to the Revolution um, for a number of reasons. But um, that's one of the great things about making students engage with popular media is sometimes the popular media stands out like John Adams, that is my favorite, oh, favorite so series. So I could watch good. Laura Linney as Ab Abigail Adams, who I adore, is just it's a revelation. Uh, but then there are movies like 300, which is just a horrible, horrible depiction of Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. um, and we can get into that whole thing about the Spartan myth in general. Like the Spartans were not crack soldiers. That's all myth. Like everything we know about Sparta was written by their enemies to justify why it took them so long to beat them or why they got beaten by them. Um, uh, and uh, it's been used to justify a lot of terrible things in history, like Hitler and his eugenics program, you know, looking at Sparta. Um, getting into that, uh, the students are then fascinated. It's like, why didn't I hear this before? And it's like politics or because it's someone, you know, history is entertaining enough. You don't need to add the extra storyline. It's like, do you remember the Pearl Harbor movie with Ben, yeah, Affleck, ben Affleck? Yeah. Matt, uh, uh, whoever else was in it. Um, I think it was Matt Damon. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, I mean, that was a Jerry Springer episode surrounding an actual historical event. Just, just focus on the history and you can get a good story out of it. You don't need, oh, he's now with my baby mama or whatever. I don't, I don't even remember what the exact storyline of that movie was, but it's- Yeah, yeah. they really dramated it up for sure. <laughs> I remember that. It was, yeah. uh, it was a love triangle for sure. Like Game of Thrones, that's all like, you don't need Game of Thrones, just go back to like old English history and you can see the exact same stuff. <laughs> I know, I might, just tell me, just tell me who it's about. Come on, I already know, just tell me, just say it's them. Yeah, um, that's, um, let that's me, a great let me, point though, digital let, history. Yeah, let me ask you this question. Have you been able to find a way to combine history with your martial arts enthusiasm? And how do you approach that? Yeah, actually, um, I wrote my master's thesis on that very topic about uh, the dichotomy of how martial arts traditions are reinvented in Western liberal democratic societies and are typically linked in some way to military traditions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, like um, what got me interested in that was uh, I had... Uh, well, one particular guy in my life who was a former Green Beret, mm -hmm. who, while in his short stint, earned two black belts in Asian martial arts. And I'm like, what's what is this 19, 1966? This, this guy is earning these special forces. But <clears throat> then also, like, comparing that to Eastern totalitarian societies, like <clears throat> Mao's China, Stalin's Russia, uh, the, the, how you know a lot of these modern martial arts including brazilian jiu-jitsu are reinventions of judo almost mm -hmm. all of them sambo is a reinvention of judo um the reason that brazilian jiu-jitsu became brazilian is because when judo was immigrating here in under tr in 1905 and being taught at west point um it, the, the gentleman's agreement happened shortly after that and Japanese migration shifts to Brazil. But I always tell people like one of the first demos, there was this newspaper where they went to, um, and I think it was the, it was Annapolis or West Point. I can't remember which one. They were on a, like a little tour. And there's, there's something in judo. It's seen as kind of like low class in Olympic sport these days. So that's another thing, sports nationalism, you know, but yeah, it's like, it's called a sacrifice. So it'd be like, I kind of pull you down on top of me, but then I flip you over, you know, it, everybody's seen it. I had an idea of it before I ever trained martial arts. Well, they hit one of these cadets with that throw. They throw it, right? But the newspaper the next day reads, cadets down the jap <laughs> so but that you know like like when i first got into those uh those headlines i was like okay i've got something here just with the tr thing and 
I would really like to expand that into it. Like I kind of really stopped and didn't go into MMA or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because at that time, like the Fox deal was just happening. You fast forward another stint. I didn't want to, I wanted things to materialize more in, in that section. Right. So because because Jiu Jitsu, they've inherently linked that with the UFC and MMA with the Hoist Gracie night. Everybody on my podcast that's in Jiu Jitsu podcasts, I'm like, how'd you get into Jiu Jitsu? They're like, 19, 1993 Hoist Gracie UFC one. Everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's it's alarming. So like as a historian, I remark on that. But now it's on Sports Center. It is in every home it is it's the it's a national sport right and um two it's 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 become nationalized as well outside of the olympics is i remember there for the longest time they have a fight card in brazil all brazilian fighters versus all fighters from different countries like stuff like that going on like it's like mm, yeah do are we trying to see which country is better i'm not sure uh, seems to be the uh, the subtle focus of the Ip Man movies. Have you watched any of those? Yeah, you know, I've seen I've seen all uh well I've seen 3 of them. I don't know. I think they might have made a fourth one, but the first one is the best and I need to rewatch it cuz I actually there's a guy that comes in on Thursdays and teaches me Wing Chun that's like 72 years old. And he's trained all over the world. He's an orthopedic surgeon from Clarksville. <laughs> so Very cool. But Very I cool. have two I have two of those dummies in my gym. Nice. I, I was curious because in, I think it's in the third or the fourth Ip Man movie, uh, it's that whole thing that you were talking about. It's a Kung Fu versus American karate that they think karate is superior or whatever. And so it's Ip Man's job to show that Wing Chun Kung Fu is superior to Japanese. There's a subtle anti-Japanese sentiment through all these movies, obviously. Yeah. For various reasons. Well, and then I think in one of them, the theme is uh, that doesn't he fight Mike Tyson or something like that yes. in a boxing <laughs> match? Well, you know, Muhammad Ali was in an MMA fight, technically was in like the first like that he fought this guy and they didn't know enough about any. They just like, well, Muhammad Ali is the greatest fighter ever. And then he fought this guy who essentially laid down when he started getting hit and started kicking Muhammad Ali in the knees, uh, right? And then Muhammad Ali ends up going to the hospital after the fight because both his knees are jacked up. But it was, uh, then there's some book about it that uh, Dr. Warnick over here at uh, ATU, he's a psychologist, uh, psychology professor. He sent it to me just the other day. He said, it's going to drop it off for me to read. I haven't read, uh, I haven't read a book about it, but it's a famous, famous story from like MMA history. You know, that's like the wild west, like back in the, the Hollywood Bruce Lee, Superfoot Wallace days and stuff, man, it's, it's fascinating. I didn't know that. I, I I thought that Conor McGregor versus uh, Floyd uh, Mayweather uh, Floyd yeah, Mayweather yeah, yeah, was like yeah. one of the first, but apparently that predates it. So yeah, well yeah, that um, that I, th I can't remember what year that was. I want to say seventy six, but I think that's late. I think I'm 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 quoting it late. But um, yeah, that's um, well then too. Judo Jean LaBelle, he fought a boxer. And he ended up choking him unconscious or something like that. And then, you know, Hoist Gracie in one of the UFCs, he, there's a technique where I put my fingers in my sleeve and I use it to choke you, strangle you. And Hoist Gracie did that in the UFC, which is kind of controversial. If you think about it, it's like that's before there were rules banning, like uh, you could never wear a uniform in, in a, a UFC fight now, you know? Mm-hmm. But that's, uh, you know, I will eventually do a book over all of this stuff that, that we just talked about over the last 10 minutes, for sure. Why, uh, why isn't uh, Mongolian wrestling more covered? Uh, I mean, if Boku was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Japanese, uh, pardon me, against um, uh, Chinese martial arts and during the Mongolian Empire. So have you had any exposure to that? Or No, not, uh, not in a lot. I have a great... Um, there is a textbook that I could never, uh, a two volume hardback uh, called the Martial Arts Encyclopedia mm -hmm. has like great articles about every martial art that there is, you know, and um, it's got, it's got an article I'm on going wrestling in it, but I haven't read much about it, man. Most of what my focus has been on has been the diffusion of Japanese martial arts in the modern world. But outside of that, man, like um, I'm, 
I'm really fascinated uh, with with ancient Egypt, and there's evidence of martial arts there. I mean, it, it that is a something interesting to I should I should uh, I could use that for filler for my China chapter, man. I don't know why. <laughs> that's a great that's a but that's a great avenue, honestly. Like, because you know, Sambo was was inspired by indigenous Russian martial arts as well. Just like it, it you know, we we can't. You, you don't want to say that um, everything that Wushu is just comes from, you know, these, these, it comes from the Kung Fu masters that complied. That's who it comes from. But um, there, I, I, those cross cultural traditions, I, that's, that's what I'm fascinated is how, you know, where was, was Mongolian wrestling in, did it influence, you know, Chinese martial arts in some way and how, or vice versa? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be interesting to look at uh just i'm sorry we're going off on it yeah no hey let's do it this is fine i'm i'm down um so it appears online you are a jujitsu purist or judo purist um is it a belief that it's the superior um martial arts form or what what how did you come to that and what made you settle on like that's the avenue that you want to teach and as opposed to other disciplines yeah so man that's that uh interesting that i come across as a jujitsu guy uh, so I do. So I have a bite belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? I also have a bite belt in Judo. Uh, and I think that they're the same. Okay. I think that I think in so many ways, uh, it got messed up because of the stylization of sport, like particularly like when, it, when the uh, Judo became an Olympic sport, they changed all these rules, man. And it made it get weird. It's like, oh, well, you can't look like the wrestlers when you do this. So don't do it. It's illegal now. You know, it, it just became a very interesting rule set that began to not look like the martial art and it began to discourage the grappling. So when I started training jujitsu, I was like, man, I heard judo guys are good at takedowns. And my instructors at the time, they knew like two takedowns each. And I was like, I can't not know takedowns just because I know jujitsu. Like we start on the feet at this tournament I went to the other day, you know? So I then, you know, but I started studying wrestling. Um, I've had a podcast. I've had one of my Sambo uh, icons on the podcast, who's actually in a former life, a pediatric oncologist, everybody, which we talked about that. And man, we had the greatest conversation. He's also the fight choreographer for John Wick 3. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So we had all this great conversation of very which li little of it was about him being Sambo Steve. <laughs> but man, what I put together, I do things that would be considered sacrilege in the jujitsu community. Like, this is going to sound so weird to you being a, a lay person in terms of like, you don't train jujitsu regularly. But um, I teach heel hooks in the gi. Okay. It's sacrilege. It's illegal to do that move in the entire sport of jujitsu. So no one that does jujitsu trains it. <coughs> Pardon me. Excuse you. Bless Sorry. you. Whatever you want to say. But um, it, it's sacrilegious to do this move because it's illegal in the, mm -hmm. in the sport when you're wearing this uniform. It's like, but I study a submission art and my people that compete MMA, it's not illegal for them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but we also have a boxing club. My wife's a two-time amateur kickboxing uh, world champion. Um, so I've, I've really, um, I've maintained a very mixed approach in my study. You know, it's kind of like uh, teaching world history. It's like, uh, and I've, I've really surveyed uh, outside of that, the guy that comes in, I mentioned uh, Mr. Roland, Dr. Shang. He is an expert in everything I'm not. Plus, he's a sixth degree in judo. He's a third degree in aikido. My wife's working towards her taekwondo black belt. Like, so it, it's kind of like what you were saying. And like, why when I was saying I'm teaching or taking guitar lessons earlier, I'm just being a lifelong learner, and like I've learned how to learn, mm -hmm. and I engage in that in all on all fronts. And uh, so, like, I'm training all sorts of stuff all the time, and I try not to have. Uh, a lot of weird biases. I study savat, which is French kickboxing, Dutch style Muay Thai, Thai boxing. Like I've got my second bookshelf over here on the other side is all martial arts books. So it's, um, but that's what got me into this topic is, was like, um, 
you know, I can't, the, one of the only, he's on my, my committee, one of the only martial arts historians in the United States it's, that was not a practitioner died of a brain aneurysm, uh, Dennis Gainty, a few years back. But um, everybody I meet that writes about martial arts in history has this stylistic bias of, you know, the Gracies, they put out all this weird history saying that they invented jujitsu. And it's like, you're one guy that learned from the guy that moved there who taught you judo. Right. You know, and he had hundreds of students. Like I've had over a thousand students since I've been teaching martial arts. I have 310 right now you know so it's man it, it is an interesting culture i can uh you know my one of my coaches says it's it's one of the last great oral traditions mm -hmm. you know it's it is very much so but it is it's be, being influenced greatly in the digital era um and that's why people like myself are like oh, well we can do this move with the uniform on it's not going to kill us Right, right. Because you know. uh, in the middle of a, of a fight, you go, wait, wait, stop, we can't do this. We can't, uh, that's, that's no legal. It's the wrong yeah. move. Don't, don't do that. <clears throat> oh, man. Yeah. Which, you know, and in some organizations with some, like a lot of jujitsu guys, they just live focused around the sport of jujitsu. That's why I was like, oh, he thinks I'm a jujitsu guy. And they would, they, you know, if you went to a tournament in jujitsu and you had on your uniform and your belt and you did this move, this heel hook, they would disqualify you and everybody would be like, you're, you're a terrible person. You're, mm -hmm. You did that move that could have hurt that guy. But it's like, dude, we're trying to rip each other's arms off and choke each other unconscious. And like wrist locks are legal. Like I've had people, uh, there's so many memes about getting your wrist submitted in, on the online. It's like a big running joke. It's like, you know, you don't know who wrist lockers are because they're just normal people who live among us. <laughs> like, cause it hurts. Like I, this comes on super fast, but it's, it's legal for, for the white belt entry level student. But mm -hmm. this move that's on your, on your, uh, now you pull the foot and it gets your knee. It's illegal at all levels of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competition. Mm -hmm. It's it's just fascinating, and it's fascinating to see why and how that crossed over. I mean, that's that's the type of martial arts history I get into commentating on. Honestly, is mm -hmm. the the development of these weird traditions uh, and rules. You know, on your on your channel, do you break down fights? Because I've seen on on Inger and, and Reddit and other sites how they break down like the great boxing matches of like Tyson. Like, look at his movement, look at how his rope and up and all that stuff. So do you, do you do the same thing on your channel or? I do a little bit of that. Um, we're going to, I have a one guy here that he does exclusively boxing mm -hmm. and on once a month, we're going to start yeah. doing a boxing unraveled podcast where we break down one or multiple boxing fights on the podcast. Um, I've done that with some jujitsu fights on my gym YouTube channel I need to get more well-versed in understanding the, the copyright implications. Because, uh, okay. uh, man, like, uh, YouTube's real sensitive on mm -hmm. what they flag. Uh, and, and Facebook is too nowadays. Uh, for example, I was listening to uh, when the last of uh, the Tool album, the band Tool, came out. Mm -hmm. We didn't record. We were not recording the audio. We were listening to it in the headphones like, I can hear you in the headphones but it wasn't, um, it wasn't recording, right? So we had to, I have a headphone amp here where it can, it can segregate it out to where it doesn't get recorded, like what's playing in our earphones. Like we can hear each other, mm -hmm. but what the, the feed, we, couldn't, we wouldn't record, but we could hear it. It caught through to the microphone like this, just a little bit. It like gave me the seconds that it caught like throughout like a couple of times. And they flagged that they're like, Hey, we're going to make money on this, but you're not, you're never going to make money on this. Don't try. And if you think that we made a mistake, you better be sure that we made the mistake before you contact us about it. That was just the gist I got from, from reading the copyright claim. But um, then too, I uploaded a jujitsu where I screen shared and we, uh, Dr. Woods and I, we had broke down uh, some Marcelo Garcia's this famous grappler some of his fights. And one of them was from this famous tournament, which the USC now owns the rights to uh, the ADCC. They stream those. And uh, it got flagged in that portion, you know? So like, I've had some, like, that's a couple of examples. Like well, when I had that, one of the bands play live, the stream still went through, but it got flagged on YouTube for um, 
they did a uh with the uh stevie nicks there's a cover they did by her and um it got flagged but so it's just it's interesting man it's um and that was just a live music of a cover that got flagged so i don't know i need to become more well versed in things outside of free use for education um or spin my podcast as an education i don't know i I haven't figured it out yet (laughs) i just i'm trying to honestly i'm going through the steps to copyright my podcast because i had some university in oregon that was like they bought a domain i didn't have a website at the time there's only and they put up like a twitter and like somewhere else i didn't have social media i contacted them they're like hey you can have it no big deal but i've been i'd had the podcast for like three years yeah and they like just use the same name and some other things so but that's man that's it though it's like you get into you want to teach history you want to make videos you end up getting a black belt at you're trying to get be a black belt at making history videos and <laughs> and jujitsu videos and you become as audio engineer and a video production artist it's it's awesome it's awesome to keep learning absolutely well eric man dr totten I really, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, it's been uh, a pleasure reconnecting with Marie and having her come on and collaborate on the podcast. If you ever want to prepare a talk or something or um, expand, uh, if you're, if you've got a project going on, you want to collaborate in some way, uh, feel free uh, to reach out. And I would love to talk with you again in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, anytime you want to talk about the Civil War or to why the Mongolians are the greatest war machine in history and uh, the crazy stuff they did. And um, I mean, uh, global military history is my thing. I'm trying to launch my own podcast about global military history and get it really down into the weeds. Like look at the, um, uh, is war in- Oh, you froze up just a little bit. You still there? You still there? Oh no. No worries. Hold on a second. Let me, there we go. Okay. All All right. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. We were somewhere around your podcast. Yeah. Mongolian Uh, war machine. Yeah, anyway, all I was going to say is that anytime you want to talk about history or uh, production of digital history of anything related to global military history, I would absolutely be honored to join. I, I very much enjoy talking with you today. Uh, sorry that I uh, speak a mile a minute. When I get excited about history, I just can't control myself. I, yeah, I was, I was drawn in the whole time, man. It was never, uh, there's never a dull moment. You know, it's, I really enjoy these podcasts where it's just one on one it can it can get weird you start doing three people at once two people or like two other people and and myself but this i I felt like we were at zero shortage for uh shared interest and uh conversation i was i was happy that it spun off in the directions it did and i will definitely keep in mind um on on military history that's something i'm fascinated with with uh, the hebrews the philistines the syrians like ancient world stuff um bronze and iron age uh, stuff but uh i will keep that in mind because the mongolian in the command a comparison of the mongolians and the comanches oh is a horse the two greatest culture. horse warriors in history oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, two greatest horse warriors in history <laughs> yeah have you um have, uh, empire yeah, the, the summer the moon bronze... have you uh, sorry to uh, empire the summer uh, moon about I, the comanches actually, the I, I have not read that one, but it's, I, it's over here somewhere. I have the book by uh, Layans, uh The Comanche Empire is the, one of the single greatest treatments of the Comanche warriors, and he gets into the environmental history as well. And there's also the amazing book called War of a Thousand Deserts about the Comanche. And just how uh, it basically the reason why the Americans won the Mexican American war is because the Comanche had just. Oh no. We froze up again, dude. Bummer.
We'll do it again. We'll see you guys later.